Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Murray Hebert uh, of the uh, Southeast Asia chair here at CSIS. Delighted to see so many of you here uh, in person, and I know there's a lot of people following us online as well. Today's program is a joint venture between the Scholl Chair on International Business that uh, Scott Miller heads up and the Sumitro Chair on Southeast Asia, where I work. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome two founding members of the Friends of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Congressional Caucus, which was formed in late, late October, Representative Charles Bustani of Louisiana and Representative David Reichert of Washington State. Unfortunately, Congressman Meeks, uh, uh, Gregory Meeks of New York, a Democratic member of the, of the uh, co-chair and founding member of the TPP co caucus, had an unavoidable conflict this morning and was not able to, to come. However, CSIS very much appreciates the, uh, and applauds the uh, bipartisan nature of the, the uh, TPP caucus. And so we will schedule another event with uh, Congressman Meeks and one of maybe his co-chair or another Democratic colleague very soon. CSIS launched a TPP um, initiative two years ago because we believe that the TPP has a lot of potential for, um, for boosting U.S. trade with the most dynamic economic region of the world. We also believe that it provides an opportunity to, uh, to boost the uh, U.S. rebalance toward Asia, uh, which was launched by the administration uh, two, two or three years ago. Before turning over the program to my colleague Scott Miller, just say a word of introduction about our speakers. Congressman Charles Bustani is a medical doctor and a Republican representative from Louisiana 3rd Congressional District co covering Southern Louisiana. He serves as a senior member of the House Ways and Means Committee and is also on the committee's uh, trade subcommittee. Congressman David Reichert is a Republican representative from the 8th Congressional District of Washington. He also serves on the Ways and Means Committee and is on the Trade Subcommittee. Uh, this program is being webcast, and you can also follow the event on Twitter at Southeast Asia DC, at CSIS, at Scholl Chair, and at hashtag CSIS Live. Now I'm going to turn the program over to my colleague Scott Miller, who is the Scholl Chair for International Business at CSIS, and he's going to moderate today's event. Scott? Great. Thank you, Murray, and uh, let me add my welcome to those of you here and those of you viewing online. We're delighted you could join us this morning uh, for what will be a, a brief event, but a, but a look into the, uh, the, the view from the Congress on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, you've you've uh, been introduced to uh, Mr. Bustani and Mr. Reichert. I'm going to offer them an opportunity to make opening remarks, and then we'll turn to a few questions that I have for them. Then we'll turn to questions from the audience. So, uh, Mr. Bustani. Thank you, Scott. And, uh, I want to thank CSIS for hosting this event, and thank you all for coming this morning. It's a great turnout, and it's a very important topic uh, for discussion today. Uh, let me start by saying that, and I've used this line several times, the United States is a Pacific country. Pacific in that we border the Pacific, and we're going to be engaged in the Pacific in every possible way, from economically, diplomatically, and so forth. But also, Pacific in the other meaning of the term, and that is peace. And I, I think, I firmly believe that economic integration through trade is the surest way to achieve security in the long run. So if we step back and look at the importance of TPP, uh, it's, it's, it will certainly help e expand existing uh, trade relations we have with six current countries that we have free trade agreements with. But also, it will expand trade with countries uh, that currently we do not have existing free trade agreements. But also, uh, if you look at the magnitude of this, it's now grown with, uh, to involve two of the three largest national economies. And with South Korea's recent uh, expression of interest, it continues to grow. And in some discussions I've had with uh, 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 Chinese government, th there is an interest in China clearly as to what this means, but there's also an interest brewing in China about participating at some point uh, in TPP. Uh, in 2011, trade uh, exports and imports of goods and services uh, with TPP countries supported an estimated 14.9 million American jobs. So from a growth potential, 
uh, and something that we desperately need in the U.S. economy, this is a good thing. Of those 14.9 million jobs, 207,000 uh, were in Louisiana, in my home state. So I have a domestic interest in this as well as a national interest in seeing this, this uh, agreement done. We also know that the high standards that are going to be set uh, in this agreement will set a new bar for the 21st century for trade, rules-based rules, uh, rules -based trade. And with uh, the situation with WTO still teetering, wondering whether we're going to we'll get there, a lot of progress has been made with TPP, and, and we think this is the next big step in trade internationally, which could set the stage going forward in the 21st century. But these high standards will help create a global standard uh, to, to allow us to move forward. Um, I, I know, let me touch a little bit on Congress, uh, and, then, and then Dave can uh, give his remarks. A lot's been going on, a lot of discussion. There have been some letters circulated both uh, on the Democratic side of the aisle, Republican side of the aisle, uh, expressing negativity toward TPP, toward Trade Promotion Authority. This is going to require all hands on deck to make sure we get Trade Promotion Authority in place. It's, you all know it's essential uh, in our system of government to, to finalizing this agreement. Um, so I can tell you that my experience with USTR has been excellent. They are on the Hill. They're working very hard. They're, 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 they're meeting with congressional offices. But we're going to need the other elements uh, in the administration to get fully engaged. Treasury, agriculture, commerce. <clears throat> to use their assets. The president's going to have to expend capital, and this is going to take all hands on deck to get trade promotion authority completed. Uh, my understanding, uh, Ways and Means is uh, very close to getting a package together with Senate Finance that we agree upon on trade promotion authority. But uh, to get the votes is going to be a challenge, and we're going to have to work. And we're going to need the business community. We're going to need the think tanks. We're going to need everybody involved in this. Just one quick statistic on it. The last time that Trade Promotion Authority was passed in Congress was 2002. Of the 270 members of the Congress in the House who voted for it, only 53 remain in Congress. We have a very new Congress. So there's a, we have to embark on a very strong educational process to get this done. So I'm very pleased to join Dave, my colleague on the Ways and Means Committee, a fellow Republican, but also Greg Meeks and Ron Kind and putting together the, the Friends of the TPP Caucus. This is a bipartisan effort, but it goes beyond that because we represent different, different geographic areas of the country, west coast, east coast, south, and in the interior. We're going to devote a lot of our time and effort to building the consensus to make this happen. It's critically important for, uni for the United States in terms of its uh, engagement in Asia, for growth purposes, and, um, and, and basically, um, to enhance our position uh, globally at this point in the 21st century. So with that, I'd be happy to turn over to my esteemed colleague. Thank you. Mr. Reichert. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks for having us this morning. And, and uh, I know Charles is, uh, and I are both excited about the turnout uh, this morning. We were told there were gonna be, it was going to be a large crowd, but this is uh, impressive. You all got up uh, early, drove through the traffic, and. Uh, to listen to the two of us speak. Uh, maybe you see, need to see a doctor. <laughs> uh, so you know what Charles did when, uh, before Congress? Um, I, was a, um, I was a cop for 33 years before I, I came to Congress. So we need doctors and cops in Congress, I think. <laughs> <laughs> maybe more cops than doctors, yeah. I don't yeah, know yeah. sometimes. I was a hostage negotiator, so that comes in handy too. But I was also, <laughs> I was also a SWAT commander. <laughs> so you got to know when to negotiate and kick the door in. And you know, when it comes to trade, uh, we might have to kick the door in some somewhere along the line here at TPA. We might have to kick the door in. But right now, you know, we're in. The, don't get excited. We're in the negotiating stage of all this stuff. Right? We're working with people. Um, you know, I tell people that uh, I, I might look like I've been in Congress for 40 years, but I've only been here nine. Um, and, and uh, I had my previous career, as I, I, as I said, but I'm excited about being here. Uh, Charles and I came in in the same uh, class uh, nine years ago. It doesn't seem like that long ago, but 
uh, it, time, time flies, as they say, when you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Some days it's fun. But I come from a state uh, where trade is critical. We are, and in Louisiana too, but Washington State is the most trade dependent state in the country. One out of every three jobs <clears throat> are directly related to trade. And uh, out of the 380,000 plus or minus jobs in Washington State directly re related to trade, um, I think 326,000 of those jobs are directly related to those uh, currently, those countries who are the negotiating TPP countries. So for us, it's, it's critically important in Washington State. And I you know, expand that to the entire country, obviously, but just representing my district, my state, you may know that, of course, there's a small airplane company uh, in Washington State that's excited about trade. There's, there's a small tech company in Washington State, that, state that's excited about uh, trade. But we have a, a huge agricultural uh, community in Washington State that is very excited about uh, TPP. We watched uh, uh, as the Korean, Colombia, and, and uh, uh, Panama agreements were finalized our exports to those countries have increased uh, tremendously. And our relationship with those countries have become uh, closer. Now, there, as some of you know who might have been engaged in, that, in those efforts, that wasn't the easiest um, process to go through either. Uh, the, the administration had to be pushed in, uh, along a little bit. Uh, Ambassador Kirk was great uh, to deal with. Wendley Cutler has, has become a great friend. And, and just I was really very impressed with her ability to negotiate such a complicated uh, contract. But this is even more complicated. And they, uh, as, as Charles said, USTR is fully engaged uh, with, with uh, all of the outside uh, entities that need to be engaged, and especially with Congress. We have a great relationship with them and, and in close communication. I'm a member uh, of the President's Export Council and have been since uh, its inception. Pat Tiberi and I were the first two uh, Republican members um, asked to join the President's Export Council. So uh, the goal was double exports in five years. And uh, our point was, as we progressed in those meetings to point out we can't do that unless we have trade agreements because the last time we did that I think was between 97 and 2007 we passed nine trade agreements and 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 more than doubled our exports so we need to we need to get TPP moving uh, all of us in this room will benefit from uh, from that effort and uh, as a result of being engaged with trade as because of the importance to Washington State, as a result of being a member of the President's Export Council. Uh, when the Korean, uh, and I've been on the trade subcommittee since uh, joining Ways and Means as, as I think, no, you, you came later, but uh, both uh, Charles and I on the trade committee um, were part of a, a group called um, the working group, the chorus working group. And that was specifically related to, for us in Washington State, South Korea, and working hard to get that agreement um, pushed through. And it was focused on gathering members of Congress together to support that agreement. And we were successful, because when the administration sees that you have members of Congress supporting an effort, it pulls the administration along, too. And so what we did, Charles and I, and Greg and Ron, got together and we said, you know what, we're going to create a, a similar organization called Friends of TPP. And our mission with the Friends of TPP is to gather as much support as we can in Congress, not only for TPA, as, as Charles has spoken about, which is critical, obviously, but also to get them on board with TPP, because some will have issues about agricultural issues, how does this affect my district, services. Some districts might be more interested in services. Some might be more interested in, in machine um, uh, you know, uh, shops and, and those products produced. And, uh,
but um, we've got to get those members on board and interested in supporting and vocal in supporting TPP and all of you in this room uh, hopefully become, uh, if you aren't already, uh, great supporters of TPP and you become a voice in support of that and sharing your knowledge and information with friends because that really is uh, where the help is needed, especially um, any of you in here who may be planning on visiting members of Congress in the near future, you might want to share a little bit uh, of your wisdom about how important TPP is to you and, and the people that you represent. So uh, I'm excited to be here today and, uh, and looking forward to working with all of you. We don't have all the answers yet, but, but having gone through CORUS, uh, Korea, South Korea, Colombia, Panama, um, we, uh, we have some idea of what we need to do, where we need to go, how that process worked. And yes, there's more countries involved. And yes, there are some other issues associated with some of the countries involved in the negotiations. But I really believe that that can all be worked out. And it's such a benefit for us to have relationships with other countries, not only, as Charles said, from the security uh, point of view, national security of each country involved in these negotiations, but really, to, to me, and, and this is, again, an old cop who has, uh, you know, really worked on building relationships with people. Uh, because if you don't sometimes uh, in the, you know, during your, your career, if you're not good at talking with people and, and engaging with people and sharing and listening, uh, you can get hurt. <laughs> we need to be sharing and engaging and visiting uh, and building friendships and relationships with other countries. We can learn from other countries, but those who are concerned about uh, human rights issues and the fair treatment of employees, we can have a huge impact on influencing uh, positive behaviors in those areas versus hands off, we don't want anything to do with you because you don't treat people fairly, at least from our perception. We, have not, we don't have all the information. But I, I really believe that it's, it's more important for us to build relationships than it is to shun uh, certain countries for whatever perception we might be holding about a certain people or country. So again, I thank you for being here, and thank you for allowing me to make a few comments this morning. Thank you, Mr. Eckert. Uh, let me start with, with a question about what you're hearing from constituents. One of, one of the things that, that I learned very quickly when I came to Washington is of all the institutions in Washington, the House of Representatives is, is exquisitely sensitive to public opinion. It's uniquely so, uh, partly because you, members stand for election every two years. And so there, there's always, members of Congress always have the pulse of their constituents if they intend to stick around. Uh, and so to start the conversation today, uh, you come from very different districts, uh, Washington State, obviously trade dependent Pacific Rim uh, uh, district, and one where there's an obvious connection, uh, Louisiana, uh, Gulf Coast, but also with a newer, wider Panama Canal. St the Gulf Coast is gonna become a Pacific port. Uh, pretty soon, so I'd like to have each of you talk about what, what specifically you're hearing pro and con from your constituents. Sure. Mr. Pustow. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, Louisiana is a state that's engaged in international trade. Uh, if you take the top three export destinations, uh, they are basically China, Japan, Mexico. So we're already exporting to, uh, to Asia. And you, you rightfully uh, point out the Panama Canal expansion. Uh, Louisiana is a maritime state. We, um, we have a number of ports, including the Port of New Orleans and that system up the Mississippi River. So we, we're poised to engage in trade, not only with uh, South America and Central America, but also Asia and Europe because of our geographic location and the, uh, the great gift of the Mississippi River, its tributaries, and our ports along the Gulf Coast. Um, like Washington, uh, Washington, I think, ranks first in exports, if I, if I remember correctly. Louisiana typically ranks fifth or sixth uh, in exports. So for a small state, trade is very important. And we also have a very vibrant energy sector. And so that gives us international connectivity sure. mm -hmm. uh, in the energy sector. So my constituents, uh, while there, there is some anti-trade sentiment, 
it's largely pro-trade, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're seeing opportunity, growth opportunity with this. Um, I think uh, in last year we had statistics for 2012, $12.4 billion in goods, mainly petroleum and chemical products, uh, were exported to six countries within TPP, and that's currently. So as we expand this, this is going to create more opportunity, more jobs, uh, more opportunity for export, sure. and especially for small and mid-sized firms. Because a lot of our exports are being conducted by small and mid-sized firms, and, and this is a, a, a tremendous area for growth uh, going forward. Thank you. Mr. Reichert, you mentioned the, uh, the, the small startup software company and the, the small airline <laughs> producer in your district. Uh, what, what else are you hearing? Uh, uh, well, you know, Washington State is, uh, um, so just to get a little bit political, it leans a little bit to the left. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. So, you know, as a Republican, I'm sort of an anomaly uh, from the Northwest. But uh, the good news here is, and I mentioned that uh, in a humorous way, obviously, the good news here is that um, even though the west side of the, the Washington State, the west of the Cascades, uh, pretty much uh, run uh, on the Democratic uh, side of the, uh, of the political spectrum, on the east side of the Cascades, it, it, it runs heavily on the Republican side. I happen to have a district that crosses the, to, you know, it's a new re, redesigned district. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, the first congressman in the history of the state, in recent history anyway that we know of, to represent both western Washington, west of the Cascades, and east. Okay. So that's important because you have different products that are available to export. Mm -hmm. And they have different interests interest in import products also. So obviously on the east side, some of you might be familiar with Washington apples. Sure. It's a pretty famous thing. You know, not as famous as New York apples back here. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Washington apples, cherries, pears. Uh, we sell a lot of hay, uh, potatoes. Um, and, and so on the east side, that's, that's very critical. On the west side, obviously, the high tech, the, the aerospace industry, but we're also very big in the services uh, arena, which was, a, was, a, was an important uh, aspect of the Korean agreement for Washington State. And that was a little bit of a hiccup for South Korea. It was a hard one for them to, to let us have a little bit of a niche in. But, uh, you know, again, it, 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 worked, it worked out. So. Um, you know, Washington State has those different interests, and it is a strong supporter of trade. Even though you have the Democrat-Republican conflict there, a little more than uh, so than Louisiana, uh, they're pretty much on board with trade, which is good news too because we have bipartisan support for TPP. Now, one of the, uh, you may have recently read an article in the Seattle Times uh, that talked about transparency. Positive comments about what I said uh, regarding TPP and the creation of jobs in Washington State and the opportunities for further exports, um, but, but uh, great concern about transparency, and both Charles and I have touched on that. Uh, we feel like, of course, there's not a, there, you know, there isn't an agreement out there for us to read, and I think that's part of the frustration. But we know that USTR is reaching out. We know they're reaching out to us. We're reaching out to them. We've got a great relationship, as I, as I said earlier. In Washington State, a little different than even a, a California, for example, in their large port in, uh, in uh, LA Long Beach. In California, they keep 70% of what they import, and they ship 30% across the country. Washington, we call ourselves the port of, of Chicago because we only keep about 30%, and the rest goes across the country. Sure. And, and so um, we, are, we, we, we are critical, I think, in, in accepting uh, imports from around the world and moving those products across, across the country. And in, in fact, I don't know if there's the Canadian contingent is represented today, they probably are, but we're in competition right now with Canada on those, on those uh, import, export, uh, uh, ports, so we want to be friends with Canada too. My heritage is Canada. I'm, I'm part part Canadian, by the way. Who's Canadian? Where are the Canadians? Okay, good. Hi, <laughs> hi, Dad. <laughs> 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 it could be.
could be my brother. Yeah. I should, that was could an be, insult. Could I'm be. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That, that's that's very helpful. One of the things both of you mentioned in your comments uh, was trade promotion authority. And for those in the audience who don't follow U.S. trade politics, since 1974, uh, there has always been an executive congressional agreement, uh, which now we call trade promotion authority, which provides for. Uh, the, the, it's an agreement about how a trade agreement will be ratified by the Congress, how the implementing bill will be treated. Trade promotion authority has been essential to getting agreements through. Uh, it, the, the last time we did this was in 2001, 2002, and Mr. Bustani, you mentioned how few members of Congress are still here. And so you have this uh, interesting challenge of communicating what this procedural tool is and to a group of people who never cast a vote on this and don't really understand it. So I'd, if the two of you could comment, and I know Mr. Reichert, you, you've mentioned in your, uh, the, your membership in the President's Export Council, you made a statement of the President's Export Council uh, expressing your personal will willingness to lead on this. Yep. Uh, maybe you could start by talking about what you see as the path forward to, to secure trade promotion authority. Yes, and when I, when I made that statement um, at the Export Council, there was an immediate response by uh, the ambassador. And, and uh, uh, his response was, you're absolutely right, and we're going to make that a priority. The administration has made that a priority uh, also. So for, for us, uh, we know that uh, at, you know, as the friends of TPP, it's critical for us to uh, first uh, uh, be successful uh, in TPA. And uh, we had some discussions earlier this week, week with other folks uh, we recognize that what we have to do, we have a huge educational responsibility right now and um, a high uh, sort of mountain to climb to educate the other members of uh, Congress, uh, both Republican and Democrat, because as Charles, Charles pointed out, most members uh, that uh, are in office today have not had to vote for uh, TPA. So there's a real lack of understanding of what that really Means So our effort in Congress is going to be reaching out to uh, all the members that we can uh, and enlisting the help of our uh, Friends of TPP caucus uh, to help us in, in that effort. Great. Mr. Pustani, you're, you, you're both on the committee, but what's, what's happening? The, the Ways and Means Committee will originate the bill. Uh, what should we expect to see? Well, uh, those negotiations are still ongoing and uh, let me back up just a moment and, and point out that we, this education process is essential. There's a lot of misinformation being circulated among members of Congress about what trade promotion authority really is. Uh, some, some think it may be an abridgment of uh, Congress's authority. There are some who think there are sovereignty issues. So there's a lot of, a lot of various mis misinformation out there that we have to educate members, bring them forward on, on what this really means. Um, we have a shared responsibility in trade policy between the legislative branch and the executive branch. And the last thing we want are 435 members of the House and 100 senators <laughs> trying to negotiate separately a trade deal, especially something as complex as TPP. So getting trade promotion authority in place uh, is essential to completing the deal so that USTR has the leverage behind it knowing that the legislative branch is not going to chop chop uh, the legs out from under them when we get close to finalizing the deal. Now, one of the things that we need to make clear to our colleagues in Congress is that there is a, an ongoing consultative approach that's being taken. Uh, Dave mentioned earlier that USTR is in daily conversations with, with Ways and Means, and I'm sure with Senate Finance, as to the status of the negotiations. In fact, two ways of being staff are leaving today to, to go to Singapore. They're going to be in Singapore, uh, you know, conferring with USTR step by step. This consultative process is ongoing, and, and then it's going to be incumbent upon Dave and myself and others who have a, a strong interest in moving this forward to get that information to the members. And um, it's hard right now because we don't have legislative text for Trade Promotion Authority, nor do we have the text for TPP. Things will get easier in some respects, harder in others, once that's available. So we have to be prepared. But the key is to educate the members now on the basic points that Trade Promotion Authority 
It's basically the opportunity for Congress to assert its authority legally in this process, in this, uh, through a consultative process, to ensure that our negotiating objectives, as we represent districts that are very diverse, making sure that those negotiating objectives are, are looked after by USTR in the midst of these negotiations. Uh, if we don't have TPA, it's going to be very difficult to get TPP done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One more question before we open it up, from me at least, um, and that has to do with sort of the geopolitics of TPP. Most of the arguments that get made for trade promotion or for, for the Trans-Pacific Partnership are commercial in nature. They're about the benefits of, of, of trade. And those are important and, and valid arguments. But there's a bigger picture. And the bigger picture is uh, the United States and its relationship with Asia and the long, longstanding uh, U.S. goal of deepening economic integration with the Asia Pacific. It goes back uh, several administrations, back to the founding of APEC and perhaps even before that. Uh, but the, the, I'm curious to know from, from each of you, what, what is the level of conversation among your colleagues on the geopolitics? Now, it's, it's a natural thing for, the, for business people to wonder about because yeah, trade agreements are great, but I worked for a big company with operations uh, around the world before I came here. And what I found was, uh, in, a, in a lot of cases, our business was better where the U.S. was deeply engaged, where there were sort of U.S.-style rules and U.S. influence in the region uh, led to better business results. So we like it from a commercial standpoint, but there's, a, there's, a, there's more here in terms of the U.S. role in the world. And I'm curious to know how that plays in the Congress. You know. Well, I think, first of all, it's, it's very important in my mind to, to consider the fact that if you create economic connectivity and integration, there's going to be less, ultimately, uh, with agreed upon rules of the road, obviously, to me, it's going to be you know, a better secure, security environment in the long run. But as the United States, and I mentioned earlier we're a Pacific power, as we deepen our engagement, the easiest way to do it is at the economic level. Um, we don't have multilateral security arrangements in Asia. We have a, an enduring relationship with Japan and, and with other countries in the region. But if we're going to deepen that security environment, maybe even ultimately figure out how to link what's happening currently through ASEAN, through the East Asia Summit, TPP is a great starting point to expand on that figuring out how we integrate that into uh, you know, what's happened with ASEAN, East Asia Summit, and, and more enduring security arrangements that are multilateral, where we have agreed upon rules of the road, is, is what I see over the horizon. That's going to be a, a long-term project. But if you go back and think about trade, the one thing that seems to cut across all cultures, no matter where they are in development, is the idea of transaction simple economic transaction. And when there are rules agreed upon, it becomes easier. And then you can expand from there. But I think one of the important aspects of TPP that doesn't get a lot of conversation is how do we look at trade capacity building? How do we link that into our trade agenda? And that's an important topic uh, that needs more work in Congress, more work and attention by the executive branch, because as we embark in tra on trade, especially with r rising economic uh, powers, helping, helping uh, to build trade capacity, um, you know, to, to better create an environment for commerce to, to occur, I think ultimately will give us a, a more secure environment. Mm -hmm. With regard to China, last thing I, I'd point out, I mean, we have, Japan and, and the U.S. are involved in this, these negotiations. We're into it very deeply now with the other countries involved. Um, South Korea is looking at it. Th yeah. I want to emphasize, this is not an effort to contain or to exclude China. This is an effort to set high standards to invite China into this and to get back to a, a truly rules-based trading system where we agree upon the, the rules and we can have fair trade fair commerce. Great, thank you. Mr. Reichert. Well, I, I really want to agree with the last uh, comment that, uh, and I agree with everything that Charles said, but the last point I think is uh, really uh, critical, and, and that's the, you know, the, the high standards uh, that, that we're setting uh, as we enter into negotiations, but the high standards is one uh, piece of it. Uh, it. The high standards should create a fair and level 
uh, playing field and opportunity for all countries involved so that everyone in each country has the opportunity to grow um, uh, and, and create jobs and, and, and provide better lives for uh, their citizens. So I always, um, if, you know, again, I have to, I always refer back to my old, my old uh, career. You know, world leaders make, make things so complicated, don't they? <laughs> it, it, but if you bring it down to the neighborhood level, yeah. you know, if you think about your relationships just with people, it's just common sense that you'd reach out to someone else, right? To shake a hand, to make a friend. It's common sense to, that we would help our neighbors or help someone across the street. Or this is, these are the things that we do uh, every day. But yet we are, we're, for some reason, when it comes to extending a hand to, to another country, all these political th um, uh, issues that are swirling around in the world complicate just the simple act of extending a hand. I want to be your partner. I want to sell you a Dodge pickup truck. You don't look like you would want to buy a Dodge pickup truck, <laughs> but maybe give, you would. Give me some time. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you want a Porsche instead. I don't. <laughs> but you know, it's just the it, to me. You really have to just. Kind of, it, it has to boil down to that. And and uh, I, I mentioned it in my opening comments that um, the the opportunity here to really have an impact worldwide. If we think we're living in a world that's, I think most people feel right now, is upside down. Wouldn't you agree? You feel like, and I know my kids have said, my oldest is 40 years old, and, and my youngest is 36. But they are, they're telling me, Dad, what's going on? The, the world's turned upside down. Well, it is turned upside down. And we have an opportunity through trade agreements, I think, to turn this thing right side up, to, to reach out, to build relationships, make the world a more secure place, and also give opportunities to those folks living in all the countries that we're talking about today to, to raise the, their, their level of economic success, which provides them with hope and a positive outlook on life. And how does that change the rest of the world? I know that you can imagine how that might change the rest of the world. And that's really what we're trying to do, uh, I believe, with these trade agreements. Yes, it's about the economy. Yes, it's about security. Yes, it's about jobs. But it's about personal relationships and opportunities and hope for the future and really making a difference and a change, uh, I, I think, in this upside down world. Thank you. It's a wonderful, wonderful piece of perspective is that what it really comes down to is free exchange for mutual benefit. What, that's what all commerce is, and that's what all trade agreements right. all wind up accomplishing. So it, it's better for all of us. So thank you for that. Let me open it to the, the uh, to audience questions at this point. Uh, before we I recognize anybody, I uh, want to let you know there are three rules for questions here at CSIS. The first rule is wait for the mic. If you're called on, wait for the microphone. We have an online audience, which is probably at least the size of the audience here, and they won't be able to hear you without the microphone. Second. When you get the microphone, introduce yourself and announce your organization. And then the third, I call the Alex Trebek rule, which is make sure your question is in the form of a question. No <laughs> statements, please. So with that, yes, ma'am. Does that mean us, too? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> We're not very good at you, you that. You get to give answers. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Jean Ning Nguyen, with voice of Vietnamese Americans. I thank you, um, Congressman Riker and Congressman uh, Bustani. Is the concern to us with the position of Vietnam as Vietnamese Americans, I am very much would like to see it concluded successfully and Vietnam would be successful in the TPP with the US and all members. To that point, since you from the House, I'm going to ask you about HR 1897, that's the Vietnamese, uh, Vietnam Human Rights Act. And it has been voted, passed, in the House, now it's now to the Senate. Um, with all the concern that you put forth, the high standards, geopolitical concerns, and also mutual benefit from both the US and Vietnam, I know that you from Louisiana and you from Washington State, both states have a high number of right. Vietnamese Americans. So Question, where please. do you see the ways and means would vote in 
helping Vietnam to navigate itself to be a successful level. So would Vietnam have any troubles with the TPP as of oh, this time? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, I mentioned trade capacity building. And if, if we, in going through this, if, if, if TPP is finalized, high standards, Vietnam is part of it, we hope to see small and mid-sized companies engaged in transactions. We think uh, ultimately that will help with the human rights side of it. Uh, as the economic standards go up, per capita income goes up in Vietnam as a result, and we know this happens with trade agreements, um, we think that the high standards that are set, the the granular level of engagement that will occur, as, as Dave really eloquently put forth, will, will help that environment. And nothing will be solved overnight, but I think you know, we'll see significant progress over time. Thank you. And, and we do have, if I could just comment too, we have, a, a, as you said, a, a large uh, um, contingent of Vietnamese uh, citizens, and they are some of the most productive, energetic, hardworking people, and they provide so much uh, uh, it, to our community, enriches uh, our community in, in Washington State. And so I know if we carried that relationship just from our own little area in the Northwest across uh, you, you know, the, the waters to Vietnam, uh, wouldn't that be great for us to be able to do that? And I think that uh, just to put your mind at ease a little bit, and, and I can, you know, you're, you're obviously for the agreement. Your, your hope is that your people can be, be engaged and gain more uh, opportunities for employment. And, and uh, uh, I, the Ways and Means folks are supportive, of course, uh, of a, again, as Charles said, a fair agreement that, that uh, is a high standard agreement and all, that all countries can can meet, and I have no doubt that Vietnam will be able to uh, reach those high standards and, uh, and also recognize the fair and level playing field and benefit from a TPP agreement. Okay. Yes, sir. You had a question? You have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, Bill Tucker, um, we do a lot of, a lot of trade work. Uh, uh, my question is um, uh, what uh, what is the holdup in including Taiwan? What are the, the objections in including Taiwan in the TPP? Well, I can take a shot at that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the TPP is a 12-party is a agreement at this point. It would take consensus among the 12 parties, uh, one of which is, only one of which is the United States, to include new partners of any sort. Uh, there's, there's no exclusion of anyone. There's a, the, the statements that have been made by leaders, including President Obama, have been that the, uh, the intent is for TPP to be the free trade agreement of the Asia Pacific. And in doing so, that, that would include all APEC, all 21 APEC members, of which uh, Taiwan or Chinese Taipei is an APEC member. So the, the, uh, there, there's always an issue of readiness. As uh, New Zealand's trade minister, Tim Grosser, once said, uh, TPP has a dress code. Okay, and you've got to be ready and willing to meet the dress code to be a part of the agreement uh, at any stage. So the, the high standards is a factor, but at, to, to this point, just chronologically, uh, Taiwan has not requested membership. Taiwan is engaging in free trade agreements with two TPP partners. And so who knows how will, this will phase out, but they, uh, they're concluding agreements with, uh, with New Zealand and Singapore. Do you have? Do you no, want to I agree. I, yeah, I, my understanding was Taiwan had not requested participation yeah, as of this point. That's true. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> my name. Uh, other end. Sorry. Uh, my name is Contessa Bourbon from the New York Times. Uh, manufacturers are losing jobs in the U.S. How can uh, TPP bring back um, jobs and to increase employment for the manufacturing sector? I, uh, well, <clears throat> I think, uh, again, it, it probably uh, it will, TPP, I think, uh, as we've discovered in Washington State, create uh, additional jobs in the manufacturing uh, sector because there'll be more demand. Ninety-five percent of 
uh, of our market, the United States market, is outside of the United States. So we can't sell all of our manufactured goods here in the U.S. Uh, we have to sell them outside of this country, and 95% of the market is outside the country. So I know that uh, from uh, just my, in my own family, I have a, a son who has a, a, a small manufacturing uh, company in Washington State. Currently, he ships all across the country. And I think these trade agreements will uh, allow him to be more engaged. He's only got 12, 13, 14 employees, but his product is worldwide. So I, I think that the trade agreement really allows him a little bit more latitude in reaching out to other countries and more access to other countries. And I think that would hold true with other manufacturing companies to generate uh, more customers. You generate, have to generate more products. If you're generating more products, you have to hire people. And there are the jobs. With a, a global supply chain, uh, TPP will allow companies from small to mid-size all the way to large companies uh, to take advantage of global supply chains to, uh, to engage in trade. But you know, as I think about small and mid-size firms, having a robust agreement with strong investor state provisions so that we can alleviate the concerns that small and mid-sized firms have in going into new markets where it may be prohibitive from, you know, whether it's cultural barriers, the cost, the concern about the legal framework. Having a good investor state uh, chapter in this program it will be really helpful. And if, we, if these small firms get access to 95% of consumers around the world, well, they're going to grow, and they're going to create jobs. And the greatest potential for job growth is with these small and mid-sized firms. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've seen, um, I'll give you an example. I, I represent a, a district that's got a lot of small towns. As a result of trade, I now have a Mexican company that has moved into a small town in my district, a town that has no more than about 20,000 people. They've hired 200 people to start, and they're expanding. They're using U.S. cotton to fabricate yarn, then they sell the yarn overseas to be made into garments, and then it's exported all over. We're now part of a global supply chain, and jobs have been created in rural Louisiana that would not have existed before without a trade, a trade agreement. Yes. Yes, sir. Claude. Claude Barfield, AEI. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion uh, about this being a 21st century agreement and what the United States would like in terms of, of new issues in the agreement. But I wonder how prepared is the House and how much have you talked with your colleagues about the kinds of things we'll have to, people will ask of us in older issues such as textiles and rules of origin, shoes, cotton, sugar, uh, catfish and shrimp. <laughs> In other words, are you, is the, it, will the House stand still, or do you think your colleagues will vote for uh, lowering uh, the protectionist elements uh, in the U.S. economy? Well, you left out salmon. <laughs> I, I, also did, I also didn't say anything about the 25% tariff on trucks coming in. So. <laughs> but well, all those I, are important. Uh, that's, I, mean, I think we both talked about that a, a little bit. That's going to be the difficult part, because every... Uh, member of the House, especially, and every member of the Senate, obviously, has, uh, you know, they have those special interests in your state and in your district. And they are going to be asking questions about those products uh, if they're made in their districts. How is this going to affect the cotton industry, which is, you know, near and near to my heart, and I don't want to lose any jobs in my district uh, as a result of a trade agreement with any other country or a number of countries. So, uh, as we get closer to, to, to learning uh, more, uh, uh, we're going to be able to share more. But before we get to that stage, uh, I know that uh, all of us on the, on the uh, Friends of, of TPP Caucus are reaching out to other members and asking them, what are your concerns uh, in your district? And then we're providing those to USTR so they understand and know um, what, you know, is confronting uh, their efforts in negotiating these contracts. So this is an ongoing communication, it's an ongoing educational opportunity and, and mission uh, that we have all undertaken and as we gain support we have more soldiers who go out and, and help us uh, with that uh, gathering information and promoting TPP 
and, and answering questions when we get answers about those specific uh, uh, products that you, that you mentioned. That's the complexity of it. You know, we, uh, we've, we've embarked on bilateral or FTAs. Those were tough, and there were issues district by district. This is a multilateral agreement. First time, really, since, uh, well, CAFTA was a, a smaller multilateral, NAFTA, a multilateral. This is bigger, and it's going to be complex. And that's why this consultative process is critical. And I, I, I share the same sentiment, uh, and I think I've, I've expressed it as well, that USTR has done a very wonderful job in reaching out to us to try to address all the concerns that are out there as they, they embark on these very complex uh, negotiations. At the end of the day, we're going to have to show benefit and significant benefit district by district. And, um, and that's how we'll win. But it's not going to be easy. And um, that's the challenge going forward. And, and that's why earlier I mentioned we really need all hands on deck. USTR cannot do this alone. They're a small agency, relatively speaking. They're embarked in negotiations, and they're trying to, to deal with things on the Hill. The president is going to have to expend capital. He's going to have to have the other agencies involved in this. Agriculture is a prime example. I mean, everybody in the room knows the difficulty we've had at the WTO level. This, the complexity of this is every bit as much as what's been seen, just fewer players, but same complexity. Uh, so all hands on deck. We need agriculture, commerce, treasury, uh, anywhere there are going to be issues uh, dealing with some of these 21st century um, uh, items that are being discussed. Yeah, we're going to need all hands on deck to make it happen. You know, quickly, as a part of that uh, discussion, uh, I'm going to make this announcement right here. Charles. Oh, great. News. This is, yeah, news. The camera's rolling. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we met with the Business Coalition uh, for uh, TPP, the steering committee, uh, here a couple of days ago, um, there was a great idea that was uh, mentioned by uh, Greg Meets, and I uh, uh, reinforced it. And Charles uh, immediately reinforced it, and Ron wasn't there, but the three of us agreed that. Um, the four of us, co-chairs of the Friends of TPP, would. <laughs> it's kind of like American Idol, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, don't you like the suspense of this? Uh, we're, gonna, we're actually going to draft a letter, and the four of us are going to sign this letter, and we're going to send it to the president, and we're going to ask the president to meet with the four co-chairs of uh, of the TP friends of TPP, so I think that's just a, you know it's a sign where you get Democrats Republicans coming together. We're going to meet with the president. Uh, we want to we want to tell him how important this is. We want to tell him how much support we have in Congress and uh, and uh, personally. And I think that's important for us to do. So uh, I'm sure he'll take us up on on his offer. That's Especially great. after I've mentioned it here today. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great great initiative on your part, and uh, we wish you uh, great success in that. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. We could probably go on with questions for another hour, but the members have been very generous. So please join me in thanking Mr. Bastani and Mr. Riker. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it very much. Yeah. Thanks. That was very good.